He acted in over 270 films with a career that spanned six decades. He was nominated for four Academy Awards, winning two. He played every ethnic role, from an Arab sheik, to a Mexican bandit, to a European painter, to an American Indian, to an aging boxer, to a Greek peasant. He became a Hollywood star. He was Anthony Tony Quinn, the quintessential Hollywood original. I was born in the middle of a Mexican Revolution. My father fought with the Pancheria. Bullets flying and the sound of cannons going on. And my mother hiding me in a coal wagon, taking me out of Mexico into El Paso. When you're young, everything is wonderful. Even the shacks that I lived in. I mean, I didn't know that I was poor. My father was born in Mexico from a Mexican mother and an Irish father. We came here to Los Angeles and he became an assistant cameraman at one of the most exciting places in the world, a movie studio called Seelys. And he didn't earn very much. At this studio, I met all the famous actors of that time and all the famous actresses of that time. It was the life around motion pictures that I loved, that people were busy, that, that uh, Rudolph Valentino would be doing a scene and I'd stop to watch him, then he'd mess it up, then they'd say, all right, let's try it again, and Valentino would then would play his part and so forth, and Vilma Banky looking so glamorous. Anthony Quinn was born on April 21st, 1915. Sadly, when Quinn was only nine years old, his father died in a motorcycle accident, and the young Quinn had to work at odd jobs to help support his family. He did drop out of school early on. He had to, to support, help support his family. And he read and read and, and, and learned about art and learned about, he had so many jobs that uh, from a boxer to a preacher to, working on, starting out on the stage with uh, Mae West. By the time Quinn was 16, the Great Depression hit. It was a tough time. But then, in 1936, it was fate for the 21-year-old Quinn when Cecil B. DeMille was casting for the movie The Plainsman. Anyway, my brother saw something in the paper. He says, Tony, look, look. I said, what? He says, look. The mill is looking for Indians. And I went directly to the studio. And there was a big, huge man. And he said, you're Indian. And I say, I'm Cheyenne. So they were offering me $75 a day to do the part. And I got on the stage, and I rode a horse, and I see a fire. And I look around. I get off my horse, and I go to the fire with my gun ready, and quickly I hide behind a tree. Cut! Cut! I hear the mill say, tell the boy not to walk out of the scene. Get off the horse, go stand by the fire. He says, enough. This boy is not going to do the part. I suddenly got very mad. I said, Mr. DeMille, you're an idiot. You don't know what you're doing. He said, what? You speak English? Yes, yeah, I, I speak English very well. Listen, by the way, that fire is a white man's fire. I know there's a white man around here. What, am I going to stand here and let him kill me in the light? I have to get behind a tree or somewhere where I can kill him. And he says, I didn't see the scene that way. I saw you standing there. And suddenly off stage, a wonderful, quiet voice says, Mr. DeMille, 
The boy's right. It was Gary Cooper. And the mill turned around. He said, all right, we'll change the scene. <laughs> we changed the scene. It was on the set of The Plainsman that Quinn would meet his first wife, Catherine DeMille, the daughter of Cecil B. DeMille. There was a very pretty girl there, and I sat there. And I had no great lines. I, I didn't know how to approach a woman. So I said, do you like Thomas Wolfe, one of my favorite writers? And she said, I've never read him. I thought, well, what kind of woman is this? Has never read the greatest writer in the world. And he said, if you want to get to know me, read Thomas Wolfe. And when you read Thomas Wolfe, you'll know me. Next day she came back and said, I didn't like it. I don't like it. I said, I want to teach you to like it. You're going to marry me. And she said, am I? I said, yeah. So I married her. Early on in his career, Quinn only got small parts playing the heavy, either a villain or an Indian or a Mexican. Dirty parts, small dirty parts. The fact that he had to play these and did play them with gusto, I know he felt that he was being uh, denigrated and uh, kicked around and not respected. In 1941, Quinn was fired by Jack Warner and he lost his $750 a week salary. But his luck turned immediately after calling his agent, Charlie Feldman. And I said, Charlie, well, now I haven't got a job. He said, yeah. Well, he says, I just got you another contract with 20th Century Fox for $900 a week, and you're playing in Blood and Sand with Rita Hayworth and Tyrone Power. Hey, hey what? <laughs> Remember that horse we stole? Remember what happened to it? What happened? <laughs> we ate the horse. You did? How did it taste? Excellent. Ah, those were good days. Spent all our time fighting the bulls and each other. We were great rivals, even then. I was in my early 30s, and I'd had a fairly good run in Hollywood and done rather well. Bought a house, sent my kids to school. But um, I wasn't happy with my life because I was still playing uh, ethnic parts. Determined to improve his acting career, Quinn made a decision that would change his life. When I came uh, to New York in 1947, went to the actor's studio, started working with Sam Wanamaker in the theater, and uh, I learned how to act all over again. And I worked for $350 a week for Ewell Brenner and uh, uh, Marty Ritt. Did a lot of television shows in those days. Did a lot of television. Five years after his arrival in New York, Quinn got a role that would catapult him to stardom in the movie Viva Zapata. It co-starred Marlon Brando and was directed by Elia Kazan. Viva Zapata was one of the great performances on film today. I mean, if you study Viva Zapata, which I have, uh, you'll see that Quinn never put a foot wrong in that part. Did you take the land away from these people? I took what I wanted. I took their wives, too. What kind of an animal are you? I'm a man, not a freak like my brother. Get out! Look, I can't even buy a bottle of tequila. We beat Diaz. He's living in a palace in Paris. We beat White. He's a rich man in the United States. I have to beg pennies in my own village and people never fired a gun. I'm a general, I'm gonna act like a general, I'm gonna take what I want. And don't you or anybody else try to stop me. For his performance in Viva Zapata, Quinn won an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor. I went to Italy because after winning the Academy Award, uh, Dino De Laurentiis offered me wonderful pictures there. He offered me Cavalleria Rusticana. 
He offered me Attila. My life really started all over again when I did La Strada. I think that La Strada convinced people that I was an actor, and uh, it opened up all doors for me. One of those doors was the role of Quasimodo, opposite Gina Lola Brigida, in the 1956 French film, The Hunchback of Notre Dame. When they offered me the part, I wasn't prepared. And I got sick. My face was absolutely bloated and sores all over me. But this was in France, of course, and he went to the, all the specialists, and they couldn't figure out what it was. They didn't know if it was an allergy, whatever. Gina said, I will not make the picture. I'll wait till Tony gets well. And it was costing the producers a lot of money. Finally, they said, Tony, stop being Quasimodo. And he opened his eyes. And he said, you're right. And so they realized that he was that much into the part. He had become the hunchback. What? What? I'm dizzy. I remember when uh, he was made up as a hunchback. The look on his eyes. The smile, innocent. And in spite of uh, his ugliness, he succeeded to give trust to Esmeralda, the gypsy, the character I was playing in the film. is always ready to take a gamble, always ready to get the best effect. Next up for Quinn was Lust for Life, which would win him a second Academy Award. Working opposite a wonderful actor like Kirk Douglas, he was really amazing as Van Gogh. It was really almost frightening because he was so convincing in the part that I knew that I had to be as convincing as Gauguin. When I paint a peasant in the field, I want to feel the sun pouring into him like it does in the corn. Is that what you think you're doing when you overload your brush? When you slap paint on like putty? When you make your trees ride like snakes and your sun explode all over the canvas? With all your talk and motion, what I see when I look at your work is just that you paint too fast. You look too fast! Whatever you say, Brigadier. Maybe you're right. I'll never forget that scene when suddenly that look came on Tony's face as he played Gauguin and he realized that what Van Gogh was doing was really much more important than what he was excited about and it developed into a very exciting scene of anger and jealousy what do you know about toil when have you done a stroke of manual labor in your life well I have I've dug ditches in the stinking heat of the tropics I worked in the docks and weather so cold my hands froze to the ropes. And I can tell you there's nothing beautiful about it. I did it so I could go on painting. I didn't have a brother to support me. I was nominated for the Academy Award for Lust for Life. When he received his award, of course he was pleased, but that only gave him much more of incentive to do better. And he never stopped trying to do better just because he got an award. Next, Quinn would get an Academy Award nomination for Best Actor, playing an immigrant Nevada rancher in George Cukor's Wild is the Wind. Sorry, No, no, don't Sorry. Sorry. she speaks pretty good, huh? Tony's a very, very open actor. No, he's, uh, uh, he'll set things in the rehearsal, and it's set, I would say, on a, on a scale of one to ten, it's set to about seven and a half, eight. 
but uh, within within those two other uh, numbers, he can uh, he can improvise a great deal. Look, I'll kill you. I love you, Bennett. I made you my son. I'll kill you. What do you think you can walk up to me like that? Huh? Say you're going away. I made you my son. I want to give you everything, my whole place, my own flesh and blood. You can't talk to me like that, Bennett. Here I was, a fledgling actor in Wild as the Wind, and I didn't, I was really scared. <laughs> I was so scared. Uh, but, uh, but I knew that he was making me feel comfortable by not ever saying to me, hey, Tony, be comfortable, because I think that's the best way for me for, to make an actor uncomfortable. But just by accept me, accepting me um, in the most normal way. Finally a big star, Quinn, at the age of 46, shared top billing with Gregory Peck and David Niven in The Guns of Navarone, the 1961 British-American epic adventure war film directed by J. Lee Thompson. I remember on Navarone, uh, there was a moment when he was playing a scene and I said to, to Tony, uh, Tony, let's do it again. I, and he said, what's wrong with it? Tony gets very voluble sometimes. It's wonderful. And uh, I said, I think it was a little too full, which uh, was my way of saying I thought you overacted it. And he burst forth in great anger and said, what do you mean too full? What do you mean? Do you mean that I overacted? And I said, well, OK, Tony, if you wish to put it that way, yes. He said, don't you understand? Don't you understand I'm a bargain basement? Treat me as that. Treat me as a bargain basement. I have my wares. I show you my wares. Your job is to choose them. So I said, that's fine, Tony. And from then on, that's the way we worked. Where are the explosives? I don't know, Your Excellency. <laughs> Your Excellency, I, I swear to you, I do not know. Where are the explosives? Hands <laughs> off. <laughs> Stehen Sie auf! Raus mit dem Bauch, ihr lasst euch stinken! Ich bin sick! Ich bin sick! Ich Tony, it always seems to me, is, is a, a sort of a, a seething volcano of, of emotion and feeling uh, that just pours out of him. Uh, I find him very moving. And in the film we did together, um, Requiem for a Heavyweight, as Mountain Rivera, he was just beautiful. See, I think of fighters as poets that are inarticulate, that only can express themselves with their fists. So I tried to bring out the poetry of Mountain Rivera, even in his voice. I tried to find him singing a melody as he talked, and he had that funny kind of voice, and uh, he was looking always for the beautiful side of life. A Requiem for a Heavyweight was that sort of poetry of the fighter, the, the boy who had nothing and who was, had a kind of honor toward what he was doing. I tell you, I'm a big, ugly slob, and I, I look like a freak. But I was almost the heavyweight champion of the world. Why well, don't you put that down in that paper someplace? Mountain Rivera was almost the heavyweight champion of the world. In the epic film Lawrence of Arabia, Quinn played a leader of revolutionary Bedouin Arabs at the time of the Great Arab Revolt during the First World War. Quinn once again got deeply into his role. He spent hours applying his own makeup, using a photograph of the real Bedouin leader, Auda. It's only to the depth that you dare go into a character that you learn from him, and I've had a wonderful experience learning from all these characters that I've played. It is my pleasure that you dine with me in Wadiram! The excitement of that film was to play against space, against the desert. And the desert is awfully, awfully, awfully big. And uh, I had to play Auda a little bit larger than life, but uh, I, I loved that, playing that part. I loved playing in the desert. 
I carry 23 great wounds, all got in battle. 75 men have I killed with my own hands in battle. I scatter, I burn my enemies' tents. I take away their flocks and herds. The Turks pay me a golden treasure, yet I am poor because I am a river to my people. Tony could play heroes, could play villains. He could play anything, really. He was limited only by the way he looked and uh, the way he sounded. Well, I don't sense any barrier to Tony Quinn. He gravitated from one kind of role, which he seemed to fit physically, to another, which he fit much better physically and mentally and emotionally. Uh, he was the incarnate leading man, the incarnate star. He had no illusions or delusions that went with it, but he was the star in no uncertain terms. He even became it to a, to a certain extent temperamentally. After 28 years of marriage, Quinn divorced his first wife, Catherine DeMille. A year later, in 1966, he found his second wife, Yolanda Adelori. They were working on a big movie together called Barabbas. And he saw this woman. And he said, who, who's that? Who's that? They said, oh, that's, uh, that's Yolanda. That's, uh, that's the girl she helps with the costumes. She says, oh, I want her to fit me. I want her to be the, 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 the one that, that, that takes care of me. She says, but, but she can't. She, she takes care of the extras. And today we have 2,000 extras. And, and, and uh, she has, she's, in that, she's in that department. She says, then I don't shoot. And you know, for three hours, they had to stop everything. And you know how expensive that can be. He married my mother a few years later. And out popped Francesco, uh, Danny, and me. He wants both families to be one big, happy family. He loves children. And I think the more children he could have, the merrier he'd be. And I produced a picture which <laughs> I wish I hadn't. That picture was 1964's The Visit. I loved Miss Ingrid Bergman, and she wanted to make certain changes in the script, which changed the script and made a picture that should have been an Academy Award picture into just another love story. My mistake was I was gaga about her, and I just acted gaga, and I didn't play the, the strength of the man. But that time we made another picture called Walk in the Spring Rain, which was wonderful, and we changed our attitudes in that picture, and it was much better. You are a wonder, you are, Will Cade. <laughs> well, you might say I'm special. Oh, and vain. No, there you're wrong, Miss Roger. It's just that you're never going to meet nobody like me, at least ways I never did. <laughs> Though I'd like to. However, the role that Anthony Quinn was born to play was the enthusiastic Greek peasant and musician named Zorba in the 1964 film Zorba the Greek. Me? If I was you, I would look at me straight and I would say, Zorba, come, or Zorba, don't come. Zorba? Uh, that's me, Alexis Zorba. Tony was the perfect actor for Zorba. He is Zorba. He was Zorba. He shall always be Zorba. Only a man with that kind of zest for life could really play that part. You've got everything except one thing, madness. A man needs a little madness, or else... Or else? He never dares cut the rope and be free. Teach me to dance. Will you? Dance? Did you say... Dance? Come on, my boy. I have no attachment to Zorba more than I have to Viva Zapata, more than I have to Requiem for a Heavyweight, more than I have to Lust for Life, more than I have to The Lion of the Desert. I've poured my soul into about 75 pictures, 
and I stand by all of them. It so happened that Zorba struck a happy meaning and a happy philosophy in all peoples. The uh, Mexicans claim that I played Zorba so well because I did a Mexican dance in it. <laughs> so, so. After playing virtually every kind of role imaginable, Anthony Tony Quinn passed away on June 3rd, 2001, at the age of 86. A true Hollywood original. I've never had a picture that gave me complete satisfaction. I really don't know what the hell it is that I'm looking for, because I write. I paint, I sculpt, I act, I do all these things, but I don't really know. I think one of these days I've got to find out what the heck it is I'm looking for, but I just try to do my best at everything I'm doing. An artist keeps looking for some new thing to say, and uh, we all get caught up in that, and uh, I'm stuck with it, and I'm looking for something new to say. Thank you.